When Wacky Steve's around, chaos ensues. I turned David's microphone into a potato for this episode, so who knows how bad the audio quality is gonna be from him. <laughs> well, gee, thanks a whole lot, Steve. Back to the show, I guess. <laughs> Remember, it's the third clap on mine that you have to sync with. <laughs> okay, got it. Cool, cool. Sounds good. Third clap it is. I'll remember that. So, uh, this is our, uh, what, second time doing this, or third time trying the sync? Uh, take take number two. Well, the first yeah. one was kind of a goof. I, I tried to do it when you weren't ready at all, so. Yeah, uh, I definitely, like, I could have tried to flounder and, and like, Re reciprocate your sink, but it was like, it's like ah! and like there, I, there's no time for that. There's nothing. No, no, there done. isn't. So I just sat there and I and I looked at the camera like it was in the office, and mm -hmm. uh, nothing really happened. Anymore. Nothing really happened. But uh, you had this thing that you were telling me about. Can you tell me tell me about it again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just telling you about the uh, this old Game Boy ad that was. Uh, uh, it, it had a picture of a man and a lady laying in bed together, and they were clearly unclothed in their velvet sheets. And then on the other side, it's got this nice little Game Boy screen pocket with the backlight, and it says Game Boy, the second best thing to do in the dark. And apparently you wrote, like, a whole paper about this. Yeah, I wrote a whole ass paper about it because it like one of the things I found so interesting about it is that like this marked a shift from marketing of of games and entertainment like that for being for children to being for adults. Mm -hmm. it, it was like a deliberate change in target audience on Nintendo to try to get an, a more older, mature audience on board rather than just making games about and for kids. That's fascinating, especially because, like, there really aren't that many mature games for Game Boy Advance. Like, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all of my favorite games for Game Boy Advance are, like, the super kitty games, like Super Mario World and Hamtaro's Ham Ham Heartbreak. Like, <laughs> like, rather than having sex, you could be playing Mario. Imagine the fun you could be having playing Hamtaro Ham Ham Tonight <laughs> in bed. It's better than sex. <laughs> it's, it's it's the second best thing so it's not better than sex oh. but it's certainly better than foreplay it comes close and it's better than fortnite <laughs> that's true but it doesn't take much to be better than fortnite yeah other than you know a giant cultural shift in the way way we engage and play with games yeah and just like in general it being like a juggernaut that will probably like not fall for like a you know maybe another generation it's the Minecraft of a generation. It kind of is, which is weird to think mm -hmm. about because it is it is definitively inspired by Minecraft. But we have already, I think, talked about that before. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we have. Uh, anyway. Should we get into this? Let's yeah. just hop right in, right? Why not? Let's just do it. Let's just hop in. Uh, hi, I'm Johnny Bartlett. I'm one of your hosts. Hi, I'm David Baxter. I am the other host. Hi, I'm Wacky Steve. I'm the guest host today on the Bundle Bourgeoisie Podcast. Hey, it's me, Bouncy Bob, and I'm here today from my hit indie Switch game, Bouncy Bob. I'm a pleasure to be here as well. Alright, alright, we've got all our hosts and guests introduced. Let's get into this. What do we have this month? Alright, so uh, first up is going to be the shape-shifting detective. Uh, second, we have the occupation. Ooh, next up we have Lethal League Blaze. Uh, then we have Ukulele. Then we have Golf with Friends. And finally, Forger. A bunch of fun games. That sounds, that sounds great to me. Isn't that right, Bob? Yeah, it sounds great to me. I, I can't wait to play all these games. I've never played a game in my life! I don't, I don't know where this bit is going. 
Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> ba- ba- uh, uh, b- Bouncy Bob, what, 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 what do you think of the shape-shifting detective? Oh man, I mean, it's a, it's a cool game. You, uh, you, it's like a movie. You, you watch it, uh, it while you play it. It's pretty cool. Wow, that's pretty insightful, Bouncy Bob. I'm really glad that uh, you're here for us today. So, uh, the shape-shifting detective uh, is a game developed by uh, Deveki Studios. And they've made a bunch of other FMV titles like Dark Knights with Poe and Monroe and The Infectious Madness of Dr. Decker. Uh, by the way, Poe and Monroe are both characters that appear in this game, uh, and you can eventually become them. Because that's like what this game's main mechanic is that you can transform into all the other actors in the FMV game and then interview people and interrogate them as every individual character to sort of like. Hold up. Yeah. You're telling me in the game, the shape-shifting detective, you shape-shift and detect? Look, I know. It's pretty crazy. Whoa, dude, whoa, dude. You're really going crazy now. I know, Bob. I know. But... Did somebody say crazy? <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. I didn't ask for you. <laughs> this is getting crazy. <laughs> We're bringing a weird energy to the podcast this, this week. This is a weird podcast this week. <laughs> I, in my defense, I didn't expect you to double down on the bit, but I love it. <laughs> you didn't expect me to come up with my own character? <laughs> well, the thing is, is that I'm not even coming up with a character. Bouncy Bob is a real character. Uh, it's 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 a character on, on the Nintendo Switch, and it's like a game that I bought for a penny when I first got my Nintendo Switch and I just wanted a game. I've never played it. I'm pretty sure it's very bad. Hey, what are you talking about? That's my game you're talking about, buddy. Hey. Hey, I'm sorry, Bob. Sorry, but hey, you know you're respecting, and you have a guest on. Sorry, Bob. What the fuck is going on? I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> COVID is fucking killing me. <laughs> All right, tell us more about this game. Uh, yeah, they also uh, had a development assist. <laughs> I didn't even get through the development developer part. Uh, they, they had development assisted by uh, Wales Interactive, who also made a bunch of other FMV games like Made of Skur, The Complex, Soul Axiom, uh, Late Shift, and a bunch of other stuff, too. Uh, so playing as the shape-shifting detective is very similar to uh, like a visual novel, just with the movie cinematics uh, sort of in place of the dialogue boxes. And the acting is, is pretty good. It's convincing, uh, with a few exceptions where it felt like a little kind of overplayed perhaps for the camera but overall all the characters kind of have this skeevy sort of uh eerie vibe about them which makes sense because actually any of the characters in this game could potentially be the killer i I found that out after beating it once uh and then looking at like the reviews online and seeing a guy that had 20 hours on it and i was like how the hell did he do that because this game is like a five hour game with like maybe six chapters or something like that and uh Apparently, he played it over and over again because every time that you play it, even though there's like no specific achievement for it, it chooses a different character in the game to be the person who's the killer. So there are uh, certain cinematics that I did not get in my game because of the person who happened to be the killer in my game. Uh, which I, I think, as a concept for a game, is, is really cool and like adds a lot of replayability, though... I did also see some people talking about the fact that, like, it makes it kind of easy to figure out who it is. Uh, If you have a list of, like, when the cinematics are different and know exactly which one is who. Right. And also, like, in my game, the answer was so obvious. I had people in chat telling me, like, no, it can't be that person. Like, it's way too obvious. (laughs) <laughs> but like <laughs> i i was just thinking in my head like okay no they have the motive they have the opportunity and they have the ability to commit the crime there's literally no reason it wasn't them so i i accuse them and uh there's this whole long like <laughs> suspenseful it, like cinematic where you have to just like wait for a while to find out if you got the right guy which i loved that i love sitting there in suspense not knowing if i got the right guy and then the different suspects coming to me in the night to be like Hey, how's it going, Sam? Hope you're having a good night. Uh, anyway, here's your scissors back. Because if you get it wrong, you get murdered, right? Yeah, yeah. If you get it wrong, I, I assume that you get murdered. Because they, at that point in the story, the murderer stops going for, like, red-headed young girls, and they start going for you. They announce through, like, a ghost channeling ceremony that, like, the next person who's going to die is going to be you. 
which that's I could get into that a little bit. This whole game is all about like a ghost channeling thing where like three people uh, accidentally like predicted a murder before it happened. And so it's all about like talking with those three people, figuring out each individual's perspective and like because maybe one person might have influenced like the Ouija board, you know, to, to come up with the name because they had already planned it. Uh, or, or maybe it's just happenstance, you know, and, and, it, and it changes apparently every game. So uh, I, I think that that's really cool. Uh, because of that, uh, I'd say that for the right person, this is a really awesome game. It's, it's a great dip into the FMV genre, and I'm glad that I took it. But I also didn't really want to dive back in right away for a second go. Uh, I know that I want to, like... Beat it, and I want to complete it because it seems really easy to complete, and it seems like there's like a lot of cool opportunities with the uh, changing of the suspects. But I also just want to kind of forget the story and come back to it like a year or two from now after I've kind of forgotten about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, you want to experience it again. You don't just want to play it again. Yeah. Like, I don't want to just jump back into the exact same movie that I just watched a minute ago with a couple of slight variations. Yeah. You know, like, I don't watch movies back to back over and over again. I watch a movie and then, like, I go back to it a while later and, and then I watch it again, maybe with a new perspective. You know? Exactly. Like, and, and I think that sort of applies to, to this game as well. So it was, uh, you know, this whole thing that we've been doing is, like, it's like kind of like turned into a job almost with like the streaming thing and all that stuff too. It's like a full I occupation. Mean, yeah, it's 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 an occupation, like a dead ass the occupation. Uh, and speaking of the occupation, we our next game on our list here is called The Occupation from <laughs> White Paper Games, who did <laughs> Ether. Wow. And this game is buck wild. Uh, the game's whole shtick is that you're, like, you play between, a, you actually play between, like, three different characters at different points in time throughout the story and experience little parts of different areas. So the story's a little convoluted and kind of hard to keep up with. But the shtick is that, like, you're a journalist and you're investigating what happened leading up to an explosion in a city. Uh, and the whole investigation takes place in conjunction with real time. So a minute in game time is a minute in real life. And so you have a scheduled meeting with some of the people who are in charge of this company. And you have to run around their office secretly and gather up a bunch of information in order to influence and change the questions you can ask them during your meeting. If you have no information, if you haven't found anything, you can't ask them shit. And if you find a whole bunch of information, then you can start to get them to confess and admit to things that had happened in order to influence your investigation and this journalism. Mm, so the exploration, the timed exploration... Uh, that you're sort of forced to go through is all in service of the interrogation sequences and the sort of interview sequences that you have where, where you get to uh, talk with people under duress. Exactly, yeah. You, you, you find out that this character named, you know, Bowman uh, was accessing a certain file at a certain time, and that kind of clears up the person who was uh, accused of being the, the guy who did the... Who, who set off the explosion, you know? You find out that the the person who set off the explosion actually lost their key card and there was no way they could have accessed it or that they were across the street uh, making a phone call at the same time as the explosion happened, so there was no way they could have been there and been the cause of it. Um, but all this information is found digging through their offices and through their filing cabinets and through their computer servers and phone logs and stuff while you're you're trying to meet the deadline of your meeting. It's super cool. It's really interesting. Uh, and I, I I can only think to describe the game overall as like a stealth horror game. Because, which is weird to say, because you're, you're just <laughs> investigating, <laughs> right? It's a yeah. stealth horror game in which you're a journalist having meetings. But uh, like, but it's... There's a stressful tension to that. Like being in places where you're not allowed to be. Oh, like, it's, exactly. It causes so much stress and anxiety because, uh, like, you're constantly trying to hide from security guards or people that work there while you're essentially pin testing this entire building, you know? You're you're grabbing like, ID cards that someone left out and using it to access the server room, but if the guard sees you, he's going to make you go wait down in the lobby. 
Um, and it even adds up to a point where like I got caught two or three times in the second mission. And so after my meeting, the security guard talked with the individual I was meeting and told him about my infractions. They confiscated all of the stuff that I found and it influenced my meeting later on because the big boss now at that point knew I was actively investigating in uh, like top secret areas. Oh, holy shit. That's crazy. It's buck wild. It's a super good game. Uh, the mechanics are, it, it, it's a bit arduous because everything relates to real time. So like you get there and you have an hour and a half before your meeting. So your ass is sitting down for an hour and a half, just like wandering around this building investigating it. It's a little arduous in that sense, but it's super cool still. And in that mechanic that it uses. Uh, and the 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 part I was really interested in this game is it's got like it's got incredible themes about uh, the sort of corporate influence on politics. And it, it reminded me about uh, of the Patriot Act incredibly because it, it was they were trying to pass this corporation wrote this act and they're trying to pass it uh, that, that influences immigration in the the country that you're in. And so as the explosion happens, which I, I haven't gotten through the game yet, but but there's major hints, uh, spoilers here. Uh, there's major hints that the corporation was behind it and planted the explosion uh, in order to frame someone and get this act to pass, like to deliberately scare the people into passing this act. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting because <laughs> the whole time there's like riots and protests going on in the city. And so they're deliberately instigating fear about this act in order to get it to pass so that the corporation can make money off of it. I, I love using, like, that, that sort of idea of protest as, like, a backdrop to something, like... And then, like, an individual story sort of using that protest to sort of talk about, like, individual actions contributing to a larger goal. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's, like, that's kind of the whole purpose of the game because you find out that, like, one of the characters you played as, that sole character was responsible for, for stopping this act from passing. Like, they went in with, with ID cards and security cards and got into areas they weren't supposed to working there and deliberately wiped the hard drives with all the information of, of the act and, and pulled the information to show the people that everyone's been lied to about this whole act to begin with. It's super good. I, I, I cannot recommend the game enough. It's a little bit arduous, and the story's kind of tricky to follow, but, but the themes and, and gameplay and what it's doing mechanically is super cool, and it's not talked about a lot in these kinds of games, and I think, I think it's worth checking out for that. Mm -hmm. I love the yeah. part where you're just like walking around, and you're just like, man, this game's kind of a, little, a little slow. I just wish something would happen. <laughs> and then like just a massive explosion <laughs> just suddenly appears out of nowhere <laughs> and just shocks the hell out of you. That scared the shit out of me. And then I, I had the realization in the middle of, like, I was sitting around in the first game part of the gameplay for, like, five minutes. Like, I don't know what the fuck to do. I can't figure it out. And then it dawned on me that, like, the gameplay was taking the same amount of time as real life. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's the whole premise. <laughs> yeah, that's what this whole game is built around. It was it was interesting. It was a very uh, it, the game has sort of set ablaze this desire for me to uh, explore some more of the kind of themes. Set, set, setting a blaze like a like lethal league blaze, perhaps. Mm. Blazing along a new trail for fighting games, a, a type of fighting game where it's not about direct confrontation, not about hitting the opponent, but rather about hitting the ball between each other just as simple as catch. This is The Lethal League, uh, developed by and published by Team Reptile. And, and, and Meg, uh, they develop Megabyte Punch. Shut up, Bob! I, I've had enough of it. I can't believe I brought him back. I, I thought we've had enough of him. <laughs> uh, we got through like a whole review without mentioning the characters. Yeah, so they made Megabyte Punch, uh, as well as also upcoming Bomb Rush Cyberpunk. I'm sorry, Bomb Rush Cyberpunk. And it looks like it's going to be a spiritual successor to Jet Set Radio and Jet Set Radio Future. Yeah. So if you're a fan of those games, then uh, hop on that train, because the original composer, uh, Hideki Naganuma, is actually on board, and he even composed music for this game as well. Ain't nothing like a wrong baby! It is 
is just such a bumpin', rockin', punk-ass game. It's got the same combat as the first Lethal League if you've ever played it with the addition of a new throw button. Basically, there are four buttons. There is a hit button. It's used to hit the ball back and forth. There's a bunt button where you kind of throw the ball into the air when you hit it. Then there's a catch and throw button that's brand new to this game where uh, you just catch the ball out of the air with a smaller hitbox and then you throw it back right away at a set speed and it's used to just surprise the opponent especially when the speed is really really high up and if you catch the ball suddenly then you can just really throw people off and then the final ability that you have is just jump uh, every character has like a different sort of movement ability uh, whether it's like a little hover or a double jump or different things and uh, the objective of the game is very simple it's just to hit the ball and then hit the other person with that ball and not let the opponent hit the ball at you that's basically it uh, every time you hit it, it gets a little faster, and time uh, eventually will pause a little bit longer after each subsequent hit, uh, the faster the ball gets. Uh, if you've ever played the Ganon fight in Legend of Zelda, it's very similar, where you're just like bouncing the lethal projectile back and forth until either you or Ganon messes up. It's like that, the game, uh, in a very extreme version of Racquetball, if you may. This game features a bunch of new characters, a story mode, uh, as opposed to just like a challenge mode like the first game had. It has an arcade mode, uh, online and local multiplayer, uh, as well as like these striker and volleyball modes that are really fun. Playing the game with viewers, by the way, is an absolute pleasure. Shout out to Nim Chimsky. He, he joins my chat uh, and just sort of asked if I wanted to play around and we did. We played a bunch of rounds together, and it was so much fun that uh, I actually had another person from the Lethal League Blaze community pop in, and uh, I ended up joining the Team Reptile Discord. So I'm going to be following the game, and if there are any tournaments in the future, I actually really don't want to participate in them, because the game is so much fun that like I really want to get competitive at it. And also, the netcode is really good. Uh, Johnny can attest, because he played a little bit of it with me. Yeah, it was surprisingly good. Yeah, it, it, it just it feels really buttery and smooth and like, oh man, I, I love playing that game. It's just a blast. I, I used to play it in between other fighting games. It used to just kind of be like sort of a palate cleanser, but uh, the more that I've played it, the, the more that I've come to enjoy it. Uh, the, the story mode was interesting. Uh, I didn't really write much about it in my copy, but uh, it's worth talking about because the, the themes in it are like, actually kind of weird in coronavirus <laughs> like it, there's this whole safety council thing that like is basically trying to ban the lethal league because a person died while playing it and that that's why they called it the lethal league uh which i mean it seems a little weird because i don't know how many people have died playing like baseball and football and stuff like that but they don't call it lethal ball and that you know? I mean, and at the very least, we're okay with long-term sustained brain injuries and damage, but yeah. not death. Like, yeah, we're okay with making someone a completely unfunctional, you know, member of society because they've retained too many traumatic brain injuries due to a sport, but like, not death. Paralyzing people from the neck down, like you know, <laughs> it's yeah, fine. it's all fine. Uh, as long as we get our good, good sport ball in. And we get to make our sport bets and get all of our money back from the fantasy football. Oh, man. I want to plug something so bad. <laughs> what do you want to plug? Have you heard of Blaseball? No. I am obsessed with it. It's so good. It's like a uh, a web-based base, like fantasy baseball game what? that's just like loaded with satire. And it's so self-aware about like the state of sports and stuff. It's fucking gold. Well, that sounds great. I'll definitely have to try that out. <laughs> Back to the story mode, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a little oh, that was just a wacky segue right there. Oh, gosh, guys. You got to stay on oh, track. Don't. Oh, not this guy again. Oh, jeez. Put him back in the corner. I don't live in a corner. I live in a bottle of piss. Oh, uh, Bob. I agree with you, Bob. This is this is the one time that I agree with you, Bob. I know, right? This guy. All right. Well, uh, back to the story, like I was saying. Uh... This episode is so fucking weird. <laughs> uh, I didn't write that. Uh, the Lethal League is trying to b ban this sport, and it's called Lethal, which is really weird because killing 
Yeah, so there's this whole safety league that's trying to stop the Lethal League uh, from existing. And what they want, their goal, their professed goal, is to end the Lethal League forever by showing people how dangerous it is vis-a-vis a a sort of uh, Thomas Edison-esque execution (laughs) where they, like, supercharge a a boom bot and try to make it kill people at the Lethal League competition. Uh, The reason why they're doing this is because they want everyone to basically just be inside. Be, Be inside individuals with like hiding in their own rooms not ever going outside and not ever having the freedom to go outside and like the politics of that in particular is just weird to me because like there's so many people in america right now that are all about like declaring freedom for masks and freedom for having to go out and go to bars and go to restaurants and stuff even when like it is a public health crisis and like there are legitimate safety concerns about it I don't know. But, like, also only one person died, you know? <laughs> and other people die in other sports. So yeah. it was just, it, it was it was, a, it was a weird kind of jumbled story. There were a lot of really cool skins you unlock by doing it, though. So oh, that, God, the skins oh, were amazing. That was dope. Like, and also, uh, there's just a lot of, like, unlockables and stuff in the showcase in the game. Uh, whether it's, like, extra modes, new stages, new characters, uh, songs uh just loads of stuff it, it's so much fun just to grind it out uh whether it's like an online multiplayer or uh just doing the arcade mode and stuff like that uh i had a great time with it I, in fact it might actually be probably my favorite game of the bundle uh probably my yeah. number one pick unless something else comes to shake things up in the ranking because like i i love fighting games and this is like one of the best casual fighting games out there in my opinion it was uh not not super easy. I, I wouldn't say that it was impossible. Uh, I wouldn't. I don't know how to fucking segue to this next game. It wasn't easier. Very good. Easier or harder than learning to play an instrument? It was easier. Okay, easier. That's good to hear. Cause the next game, Ukulele, is not about learning an instrument either. Wonderful. Uh, this is Ukulele and the Impossible y- Lair. A uh, game by Platonic Games, who might have done a little game you've heard of called Ukulele. It is the the uh, spiritual fan made successor to Banjo Kazooie, hence the instrument named Duo. Uh, this game, however, is not the the three D platformer that is you know Banjo Kazooie. It is this is a two D platformer, uh, more akin to the Donkey Kong Country games, and I. I was mixed about this game. I'm probably going to get a lot of flack for this because apparently everyone absolutely loved The Impossible Lair and thinks it's, like, top-notch and better than the uh, 3D ukulele. But I, I wasn't crazy about it. It it does a lot of really great things for the genre that I haven't seen done in these sort of 2D, 2.5D platformers in that, like, there's an open-world map that you can explore in between the levels. There's a ton of collectibles you can find in those maps. There's puzzles and stuff in that 3D map space. Uh, there's, like, these... You collect tonics, which influence your gameplay. You can do things like make the enemies stronger so you earn more points. Mm. Or you can do things like give yourself big he- a big head and googly eyes. Or <laughs> uh, give yourself, like, the ability to glide. So there's all these little tonics that can, like, influence your gameplay if you have them activated that or not. That kind of sounds to me like a... Like in Bastion or in Halo, like the sort of uh, optional challenge things that you can add to make the game like a little bit more difficult if you would like. The skulls are. Yeah, that's exactly what it reminded me of. There were some that made it difficult and there were some that just did cosmetic things. Like you could change the game to be noir style. <laughs> that's cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was super cool. Or like GBA filters and stuff. Uh, it was it was a really cool look at those like the the changes you could do to the levels and that was super cool. But the the gameplay was like i don't know it's what you'd expect from a 2d platformer it was like you're you're running down this this flat plane you're avoiding enemies you're you're jumping in barrels you know all that 2d platformer jazz all that jazz all that jazz it wasn't anything special or anything it was just kind of like the more or less the same of that kind of gameplay that you get from DK Country or something like that or any other 2D platformer. Uh, and I just, I, I found that gameplay to be kind of, and this is just a me preference thing. 
I found it to be kind of monotonous and repetitive and like you there, there's no real player agency you're just dropping yourself into levels and avoiding things so it wasn't my style but it's still it's still a really I could tell from playing it that if you enjoy this style it is a very very good game of the style uh, there wasn't there wasn't much in story you know it's a, it's a kids story uh, I use that I, I use air quotes there because you know it's not like it, it's not like a kids kids story but it's 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 a more childish all audiences general audiences yeah yeah it's a childish playful story it's not it's not like you know no one's dying in here you're 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 not you're not your long lost dad looking for their son or whatever. Uh, it's it's just you know the, the the bee king has stolen all the bees and you have to go save the bees. Isn't there a whole thing about him being like a corporate overlord? Oh yeah, absolutely. There's <laughs> yeah, he is he is like he's running a corporation and enslaving the bees to do work for him to make money. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. That's <laughs> but it, it, it's it's so just like softballed in there that it's really hard to miss, or easy to miss. Mm. Um, and it's not like emphasized or anything. You're just kind of like dropped in, and they're like, ah, he's got the bees again. Go get him, ukulele. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's you know save the bees. That's that's what the story's talking about what? which is like a good theme we need to save the bees but i'm sure there's better bee saving games out there and if not <laughs> someone could very easily make a game about saving the bees that's better than this one banjo kazooie had a bee saving level it, it had it had levels banjo kazooie bees. did yeah because yeah, you were collecting honeycombs and shit yeah yeah or well actually i don't know if you're saving bees because you are a bear and you're, i mean that's like but there are bees well obviously as a bear you would want to save bees right because right? if your honey you supply to, runs out you have to preserve the, the honey supply okay you won't be able to do anything about the rumblies in your tummy the, the rumblies in my tummy <laughs> <laughs> okay bob thanks <laughs> uh yeah so that's that's pretty much the game one thing i found super cool about it was that the the final boss level can be attempted and played at any time you, so what you're doing as you're going through the levels is basically collecting armor that you can lose through the final level. Uh, and so the game itself, if, if you don't want to collect any armor, you can go fight the final boss right away with no armor. Yeah. And it's, it's a realistic, achievable thing to do, honestly. That was something that I wanted to ask. Did you try the final level? Yeah, and it, <laughs> I, I would have got there if I had stayed persistent at it because... Uh, E e each time I did it, I progressed about 13% with the amount of armor I had. And, you know, it was really just, like, exposing myself to the new mechanics and what was happening in the level mm -hmm. that caused me to lose the armor. So if I just kept repeating it, I would have got there pretty easily. Uh, but I, I didn't actually finish it. And I was doing it with seven pieces of B armor. Um, and you can get up to, like, 20-something. So... Yeah, it, it, it's realistically doable without even doing any of the actual platforming levels and stuff. Huh. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it because it means you have to attempt it like 40 times learning the level rather than like once or twice maybe. But uh, but yeah, I, I thought that was a cool feature that they don't confine you to needing to beat the entire game to go finish it. Yeah, that that's one of the things that I really liked that the the completionist mentioned that like apparently the final level is legitimately like the hardest level in the game. It's like 15 minutes long or something like that. And like Yeah. You can just attempt it straight up from the beginning. And and that's such it's such a cool little thing that like like you know Breath of the Wild does that too and, and a lot of modern games are starting to do that and I really appreciate that. Yeah, so you can like you can really challenge yourself as the player if you want the Im the impossible lair, or once you start collecting bees, they call it the not so impossible lair. So you can do either version of it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's super cool. I think it's a great game if you're into that genre and style. I think there's absolutely no reason to pass it up. It's it, it, it's phenomenal. Uh, it wasn't my cup of tea, but that doesn't mean I can't see why so many people laud it as like a phenomenal game. You know? Oh yeah. It yeah. You know, it's it's like uh um it's like golf. I'm not much of a golfer myself, but I I totally get and understand why people love golf. I love golf. Oh yeah, uh yeah yeah you do, but uh you don't really have much many friends do you to to play with you do you Bob? No no I don't. I'll play golf with you. Really? You'll play. Yeah. With me? 
Well, that's the one where you stick the dynamite in the holes and try to blow up all the gophers, right? Hey, Bob, I don't think that's quite right, Bob. Bob, I got, I, I got a bounce, Bob. You, you know, I, I'll, I'll be right back. Uh, Bob is gonna go to the bathroom. In the meantime, I'm gonna tell you all a little bit about Golf with Friends. Uh, Golf with Friends is the next game in the bundle cycle. Here, it is published by Team Seventeen Digital. Uh, they've published a bunch of other games like The Escapist, uh, Blasphemous, which is a game that was in the bundle cycle a while ago. The original ukulele, uh, Genesis Alpha 1 and Atomic Chef from last week's bundle, uh, My Time in Portia, uh, The Worms games, Overcooked, a bunch more. Uh, but the developer, Blacklight Interactive, they've made no other games. This, they, they, are, they are a putting team. They, they are all about golf and, and the putting scene there. So they're presidents of the United States? Uh, they're presidents of golf, not not of the United oh. States. But they do play with the president frequently. And they're the only people who will play with him. I play with the president. Yeah, okay. So this game is all putting all the time. You putt by just clicking and dragging to sort of gauge a, a power and direction. Uh, it's really simple, easy to understand. There's a free cam so that you can look around a little bit before you make your shot. There's a whole bunch of different customization options for your ball, uh, from unique sizes and shapes to uh, unique rule sets, alterable physics, uh, and cool unique game modes like uh, dunk mode where you have to like uh, dunk the golf ball into like a hoop. There's like a hockey mode, an exploration mode where you can just kind of have as many hits as you want and just kind of explore maps. And a party mode where you have like an added jump ability and other kind of Rocket League-esque power mode abilities like the ability to like freeze in time or like rocket away uh, it's, or have an extra double jump. And it's a lot of fun. I had a fantastic time playing this with a couple of friends. I uh, played it on stream, and actually it was the game that I was playing right when I hit Affiliate. Uh, I was drinking a Four Loco and, like, having audio issues, so I, like, had to duck out of there and I passed out on the floor. But you know what? It all, it all worked out great in the end, because, uh... You know, as one does when they golf, you, drink Four Locos. You know, drink water. Uh, and, and don't, over, over, you know. Anyway, so this is this is not as much fun alone as you can probably tell from the title. I tried it a little bit alone just just to see how serviceable it was as a solo golf game, and I mean it's all right. It's got like a really extensive level editor and, and workshop support, which I thought was really cool. I played a bunch of levels like a, a Sonic the Hedgehog themed level that was based around like Green Hill Zone, a uh, pizzeria level that ended in the last three levels being like. Uh, a recreation of Mario Brothers, uh, like a, a recreation of Dust DE from Counter Strike, uh, and also like a recreation of a bunch of like local golf course, pre-made golf course sets. So I would one hundred percent recommend this game if you can get friends to play it with you. Uh, but if you lack friends, maybe uh, avoid this one. There are lots of other better solo golf games. There's, like, golf RPGs, there's golf everything from PGA Golf Tour to Golf Story. You, there's no shortage of other golf games out there if you want a, a better solo career kind of experience. You won't be finding that here, but if you want putting with friends done really well, really accessible, easy to get hop into, easy to have a good time, then this is the game for you. There, there's no need to, to forage for a good time here. There's no need to forage for a good time in our next game either. Forager by Hopfrog. Uh, this is... God, that sounded like a sales pitch. <laughs> no, it was fine. It, it worked um, great. Keep, keep it going. Keep it going. Uh, Hopfrog, this is their only game they've done, and they have oh, they have the cutest little splash screen when you load up the game. It's like, I'm Hopfrog, and I spent so much time in developing this game. I hope you enjoy it. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, it's so wholesome, and, and I love it, and I do enjoy it, Hopfrog. I do. It's a good game. Uh, it's a... This is a survival crafting auto clicker game. Uh, by auto clicker, I mean it's like cookie clicker. You know, you click the cookie over and over again, and it generates the resource, and then you can use the stuff to buy more cookie clicking capacity. 
Um, it's it's that same kind of style game. Uh, it's it's self described as an auto clicker, mm. in that like you you build forges, you build smelters, you build all these little these pieces of equipment that you shove the resources that you're farming into, uh, in and they just like automatically generate the next resources you need for things. Um, yeah, so it's 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 that kind of style. It's a little more interactive. It's like three D. Something about giving players agency and the ability to move in an auto clicker just ups the gameplay like a hundred percent, and I'm already obsessed with auto clickers to begin with, which is uh, so that's super cool. I, I really enjoyed it as an auto clicker. Uh, it it has um, the the resources are a little uh, they're hard to come by, but the game has really good progression. Uh, you feel the growth as you go through. There's like four dungeons on the map that you have to go through and solve these little puzzles inside of, and each of them gives you like a unique rod uh, that you can bring back into the real world and play. Eventually, you get like a lightning rod that lets you just destroy resources. You get a rod that summons enemies. You get a rod that like freezes things in place, and you get a rod that explodes and sets things on fire. And once you get the rods and start upgrading them, you you destroy. Like you don't need to mine anymore because you can just blast everything away. Um, there's like a greed potion that you can get and if you drink that with the lightning rod you can make like 5k in two minutes it's insane uh, so as as you progress the progression gets really like it rises exponentially and you get much much better and much you become able to gather resources significantly easier and stuff watching little fragments of your stream just like scared me with your production at all because, like, I only saw it until, like, the <laughs> later stage, and I don't know how you got to that point. So just seeing, like, hundreds of numbers all flashing up at the same time, and you're like, this is my little farm over here, and this is the spot over here where I do this. And it's just like, oh, my God. I love, in Animal Crossing, I've done it. In, like, any sort of, like, crafting and, and like, management game, I always build production hells. <laughs> it's it's so great. I had, In this game, I had, like, four tiles dedicated just to my banks because ma banks produce more money. So I just had, like, rows of banks just farming cash for me, baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> and yeah, just, just watching that, it was just like, oh, God, it's, like, so many numbers. But it's so good. I imagine that the process to creating it probably felt like crack cocaine. Oh, a hundred percent. That was just like dopamine left and right. It was like, ah, I've got enough gold bars now. I can make a bank. See, yeah. uh, it was so good. And I, I think there was something really charming about the way they presented the sort of like civilization. Uh, you know, there's not much for story in these kinds of games, but I like to pick out the kind of themes and ludo narrative and what the game is talking about through that anyways. And the game presents you with, four upgrade paths for your abilities you have economy industry farming and magic and I, I think magic is relatable to science in real life and these four things build up all of the skills and abilities you need to actually make your civilization function and be able to produce these things and so I thought that was interesting commentary on like what we have in the real world and how we do have these sort of four working parts of like economy industry farming and science all kind of blending together to make what we consider to be our society or our civilization yeah and so like i i think it's a great game i i think there's not a lot there in storyline but it's a it's a phenomenal game to just like put in the background and passively play while you're doing other things you can you, you know you can visit it and do a little bit of mining and and uh, lightning bolting trees and whatever what have you gather the resources to do whatever you need and then like build a structure and have that structure do some work while you're you know working on your book or whatever so i think it's a great background game i think it's a great alternative to like cookie clicker if that is the kind of style of games you like uh i i think i think it's a fun one and it adds a lot to the genre of like what you can do in the sort of agency and the upgrade paths and everything and it's got the game has a great in game too so there's there's uh in-game stuff to do once you've completed like once you've bought all the land and built upgraded all your stuff they have this thing called the void which is like uh like the diablo dungeons where you go into the void and you can just you go down to infinity there's there's no stop to this dungeon and as long as you clear levels you can continue to keep progressing down and so if you if you're good at it if you've got enough gear if you're if you're playing really well you can you like you start seeking the leaderboards and there's like people have gotten to like floor a thousand on this damn thing and that that's the end game is is seeing how far you can get in this void so I, I do like that they have some sort of in-game content too that's pretty fun and engaging how long would you say you could spend like 
minimum maximum with this game like just getting to the end or versus like playing the end game just a shit ton well let's see here i have this is this is not gonna be a number i want to see <laughs> uh, I played 28 hours of this game this week, and I was still having fun. Wow, and, like, you didn't, like, idle the game at all? You didn't, like, leave it open? I, I idled over one night. <laughs> okay, only one night. So so I probably put about, like, I probably put about, like, 15 real active hours into it. Okay, and that, that's, that seems yeah. like a good amount of time for a game like that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was enjoying it, and I still, like, I still hadn't finished everything. I I was, like four pieces of gear from being fully upgraded i had all the land built but uh that that was the next thing i was working on was getting the electronics i needed to upgrade everything so yeah it's, it's got a lot it's got a lot of gameplay in it and it's it's a lot of fun i think it's i think it's a good good little game it's a good little game just like uh good little game. just like the, the the little little game that we're gonna talk about in our extras what that's it though we finished our Six games? Yeah, we finished the six games. Now we're now you only got one one game left uh, out of the extras. Now we're in the extras. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's get into it. Like, yeah, thanks, guys. I hope you enjoy those games. Yeah. I, I think this week has been pretty solid so far. It's true. I, I really have enjoyed all of the games that I've played so far. Uh, yeah. I've got a couple more uh, that I'm a little bit less excited, but I'm still interested in seeing where they go. Uh, two different multiplayer titles and uh, two different single-player titles for me. But I've got Catherine, so I'm I've got I'll have hours to talk about. Yeah, you'll have a lot to talk about with that. I bet I'm excited to hear you play that and see what your thoughts are. But <laughs> this game that we have in our extra today, I called it a small game, and that might be an understatement. It's called Alt Two Five Four. It is developed and published by Rename Studios, and and it is their only game. It is a minimalist action adventure exploration game where uh, the active play space is uh, 26 by 21 pixels large. So it's minimalism at its core. The protagonist is a single black pixel, and the story is told through wordless cutscenes and... Uh, the very short little logs that you can find and read through that show you one word at a time, maybe like one sentence. And so you'll just have to read it like, it is a pretty solid game. I enjoyed the void dungeons. I don't know. Like, and you have to it really take it slow, I feel like is what I think the point of that is and the point of a lot of the design decisions in this game because it wants you to sort of take in and observe the world uh, slowly to sort of get uh, an idea of how things fit together in the larger sort of context of it. The initial struggle is just figuring out what everything represents. Uh, you know, you have to sort of struggle to find out, okay, so pink f pixels are switches, Blue pixels are things that I can read. Purple pixels are boxes and things that can be moved. Red pixels are enemies, and like those enemies can either have like a purple poison trail or a red fire trail. And you can, you know, douse yourself with the the water in the game if you get set on fire. I mean, like it doesn't tell you any of these things, and all of the sound effects are really like shippy and, and bit tuned. So it, it's all about like trial and error, trying to figure out what all of these individual things mean and and how you relate to them as your little black pixel so uh you just wander around the world collecting keys and you find matching doors for them uh you have a, a dash ability that you can use to navigate this big big large world and uh it's your only attack you just can smash into enemies with your whole pixel body and it can get a little frustrating at times uh it, i wish that i had just like a, a a more basic kind of attack than 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 thrusting my entire body at them because like it, it's really easy to take damage but death is also very cheap in this game uh death is one of the main things that your character has kind of above the rest of the world they, they can die as many times as they like and keep respawning at uh 
different respawn points that you unlock throughout the world. It's just all about trial and error and figuring out uh, how the world works and, and the way that things are interacting with each other. And there, there are like uh, hidden little secrets in the game that make me really excited about it. That that like really freaked me out. Uh, for example, there's this sign in the game that that tells you like, hey, if you press uh, Alt two five four, I wonder what happens. And if you press Alt two five four, it just goes like, but a ding, and you just your character dies. And uh, that like was cool, but uh, it sort of made me go like, okay, well, I guess that's it then. But then when I played the game at two fifty four a.m. Suddenly, my character died, and I was like, what? What? How did I die? And I looked behind me, I looked at the clock, and it was 2.54, and I was like, <gasps> oh my god! Because uh, that sign also said something like, I wonder what would happen if you pressed Alt-254 in real life. And I guess that was the cryptic meaning of that. And so, in that sense, it sort of feels like playing uh, like an old-school... Uh, NES or or like Atari adventure game like you know the original adventure where you have to sort of have a pen and paper out jotting things down and notes about the world and, and how things interact with each other uh, it was so rad and also I'm pretty sure it was made during COVID. I, oh yeah hit me I have another quick thing for you yeah. another quick little easter egg if you'd like hit me, hit me. Uh, uh, turn around to your computer real quick and open up our document uh, and then do you, do you have Numlock turned on on your computer? Numlock? Yeah. Uh, now now hold Alt. Alt. And press two five four. On on the numpad. Oh okay. So like, what did it make like a little so, black square? Yeah. So hold Alt and then type two five four. Wait. So that's the meaning of the game. That is your character. Alt two five four. A single black pixel. Is oh. <laughs> it's the ASCII code for a black pixel. Did you just Google that because you were like it has to have another meaning? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Okay, that makes so much more sense now, actually, because like a lot of the game is sort of about following around what appears to be like. Uh, another version of yourself or, or, or perhaps uh, like a clone of yourself and I, I think the implication is that it's a memory that you had of yourself in the past and you're trying to remember like who you are and what your purpose is in this world uh, but the fact that like I can now definitively know that Alt254 is simply just the name or, or, or like, like it's what the character is. Like I, th it's way off my head. <laughs> That's it's your character's name and ASCII. It's the, the character's name and ASCII, and also a, a consistent code that is like built into the world, even into like some of the pixel art in the world. I, I have a clip of me freaking out because I found Alt Two Five Four in the pixel art of the overworld, and I was like, wait, is this everywhere? And legitimately, I started seeing it everywhere in the real world. <laughs> like like, uh, like the Witness John Blow style. If you've ever played that game, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, this feels odd to recommend because like the gameplay is so incredibly basic, but the exploration is so fun that like I, I just know that this would be someone's jam in, in COVID. Like, just the, the tiny little window... Uh, the, the minimalistic perspective it, it makes you feel like you're exploring a massive massive world through a tiny little microscope and the feeling of, of like being able to sort of go out into a larger world while you're in a claustrophobic space is something that i feel personally like i'm very relate to that a lot right now uh and it, yeah. it seems like this game probably was meant to elicit that because it mentions coronavirus and like not wanting to go outside because of the masks and like stuff like that, uh, needing to have masks and all that. I don't know. It was just it was an interesting game, uh, but I don't know. Uh, will you like it? I I can't say for sure. I I, I enjoyed mm -hmm. my time with it. I don't know that I'm gonna finish it. Uh, I think that more people should play it though. That's for sure. Hell yeah. Well, that's all we have this week. We did it. We got through it all. Yeah, we got through everyone. We'll have the other extra next week as, as well as, as the other games. Neato SpaghettiO.
Neato Spaghetti O. Okay. What's your game of the month oh, so you far? Too. I was going to ask you. Haha, <laughs> sucker. Got it. First. Okay, fine. Uh, I'll tell you. I say Lethal League is the best game of the bundle. So far, mine is currently the occupation. I, I, I don't think I did the game enough service in talking about the story. I, I think there's a lot more there than I brought up, but I, I really hesitate talking too much about it because there's so much going on in it. And I want people to experience it mm -hmm. in full themselves. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think the occupation is primo. And you know, like, there was probably a little bit that I, I failed to mention about uh, the shape-shifting detective that was really fun. Like, the, the kind of nonsense that I got into uh, with gaslighting people about the fact that, like, I'm a, I, I would just tell people, like, hey, I'm a shapeshifter. And then they would freak out and, like, call <laughs> the person who was, like, the real person and, like, why is there, why, why am I, why, why can I hear them on the phone even though they're standing in front of me? <laughs> and, and, and then later <laughs> just, like, making them, like, oh, it was just a big old prank, haha. -ha. And the game kept going and uh, that, that, like, blew my mind and just messing with people, like, that, that never got old. But at the same time, yeah. like, Lethal League is a game that I'm going to come back to, and I know that I'm going to come back to. I exactly have to shout it out for that specific reason, uh, and also because the competitive community, though small, uh, seems to be very active, and uh, I, I just I appreciate that they they hopped into my stream. We'll uh, we'll drop a link to that Discord in in the the comments or the the, the description of the podcast. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, what other games have we been playing? Uh, I've been playing some more Valorant right now, some Hyperscape, mostly bundle bourgeoisie games, but yeah. I also did, I, I started Wasteland 3, which has been pretty top-notch. I got to fuck a goat. That was, I really enjoyed watching you play that. That was fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> I, I want to I wanna get back to that one a bit. And uh, I've also been doing mainly just uh, bundle bourgeoisie stuff, though in between that, uh, I did play a little bit of Pikmin 2, which was awesome. I still plan to finish that. Uh, I've also been playing a little bit of WiiWare stuff. I started Sin and Punishment. I want to go back to that and try it again. Uh, and I also played a little bit of Modern Leopard 2 with a friend. Very, like, like earlier today, actually. Yee yee. Uh, this month's charity is the International Medical Corps, which is a group of first responders that provide relief to areas hit by natural disasters. And they also help train those communities to be able to be self-reliant and deal with said disasters on their own as well. That's awesome. In case you're interested in knowing what you're supporting when you purchase these games. We got some other free games as well that are uh, around on the web. We got Railway Empire. Uh, so that's cool. <laughs> I, I included the dot 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 rip because it was a game on the Humble Bundle like a month ago. Yeah, no, like, <laughs> I was, like, <laughs> trying to figure out why, but then I was like, yeah, no, that's why. Uh, we, we, we already paid for it, but hey, now you can have it for free. But if you liked what you heard about the game and you didn't pick up the bundle, it's free now. Yeah, and I would recommend that one. It was really fun. Uh, it was a cool railway simulation game. Uh, and then there's also Where the Water Tastes Like Wine, which it seemed like you took an interest in as well. I think that game looks absolutely beautiful, and the story is apparently about, like, Manifest Destiny in Depression Era, uh, which sounds super cool. So I, I really love the art style. So, like video game Grapes of Wrath? Yeah, exactly. I love that. And and I, I cannot stress how great the art style looks. It's fucking gorgeous. Uh, GOG also has tons, including the Occupation demo, if you wanted to try that game out from this bundle. And then, as always, we'll have a link in the, the comments about the GameSpot article with a whole bunch of other free games that are going on right now. Sweet. Woo -woo. Woo -woo -woo. Answers from last... Oh, should we should we review our question from last month and, and talk about that real quick and then shoot them out another question? Yeah, why not? Our question from last month was, uh, if you could experience any moment of history in a video game, what would it be? Mine was the creation and building and like all the sort of uh, information the, the 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 timeline around the building of the Great Wall of China. Uh, I don't know if David ever gave us one. I didn't. So I just in the in the moment that we started thinking about this, I, I started trying to come up with something, and I'm going to say uh, the Peloponnesian Wars. I, I, Ooh, I, that's good. I, I want a a third person action game set in the Peloponnesian Wars. Hell yeah. Okay. Uh, uh we had. You wanna you wanna hit the first one? Yeah. The second one, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll hit the first one and then hit the second one. All right. So uh, Conway hit us up, uh, telling us that he thought it would be really awesome 
uh, to play through a game either as a heroine or uh, sometime around the women's suffrage movement as a person of color trying not only to fight and survive for your own rights, uh, but all of that uh, in the 1960s civil rights movement. Uh, and I think that's an interesting idea. It was kind of like, kind of reminds me of a, a sig Sigma theory a little bit. Yeah, kind of that sort of like uh, idea of like playing in that sort of like Cold War atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a really cool idea. Uh, and then our other listener, Slanish, yeah. said, I, uh, I think Heian era Japan, uh, which is considered the huge romantic period with the development of like the high court in ancient India as Buddhism is becoming the prevalent religion would be super cool. Both would be rife with opportunities for some really amazing art design and theme, which I think is uh, absolutely true. Yeah, they, they mentioned uh, Ghosts of Tsushima as being a really good example of being a game that was very close to this period of time. That is uh, very, very awesome. Yeah. Hell yeah. What's our question for next week? This is our short one, so. Yeah. What is your favorite bug that has occurred in a video game? Ooh, that's good. I, I say that All while right. I'm looking at the fly that's buzzing around my room. <laughs> <laughs> what is what is the favorite your favorite bug you've ever occurred with? I, I think I have an answer for this one already because it just happened not too long ago and I really enjoyed it. Really? Which one was it? And that was playing Hello Neighbor when I <laughs> launched into space and landed on the roof and completed the entire first level because of a trash can bug. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bug it's a feature in that game <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're not wrong <laughs> oh i love that that's great <laughs> uh, well well we did it yeah we got through mm -hmm. thanks everyone yeah, for joining us thing. subscribe to the podcast you know like comment subscribe you want. Pressure. <laughs> Check out all their streams. They do it every day. The backstab and Kafaker both do it. Oh god, and they got a Patreon now. Oh, oh man, oh, Patreon. Look at all that sweet, stuff, sweet man. money you Discord can give them. Oh, oh, wacky Steve's been ever been so Discord, excited about them. the thought of sweet, sweet cheddar Discord. dripping down oh, into man. their supple wallets. Bob oh. is back. Ready for a sequel. Also, Discord and, and, and they have a Steam group now for co-op games. Yeah, oh, if you uh, want to join the Steam group like Bouncy Bob here, then uh, make sure you go ahead and just ask us or just join it. I don't know. Yeah, he said Jar, bye. Bye, bye. <laughs> That's our show. Yeah. <laughs>